Uh, we're starting a new series today through the book of First uh, Timothy. For the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how Paul invested in Timothy as a son in the faith and gave him some real practical steps on how to live the Christian life. And I think this would be very, very beneficial to us as we go into the summer. Today, we're going to start off with a question, and that is, what is so great about grace? What is so great about grace? Now, what Paul's going to do to Timothy is he begins the book in an interesting way. He's going to tell him to be aware of the greatest lie that Satan will whisper into a person's ear, and that is, you're really a good person. You don't really need a savior. You're good on your own. And if you turn on the television or look on the internet or listen to podcasts, you will hear this kind of message. You're not really that bad gospel being preached all over the country, right? I mean, really, you're not really that bad. I mean, people won't talk about the cross. They've gone on record and say, said they won't talk about sin. They won't talk about death. They won't talk about hell. They won't talk about the grave. And I know what you're thinking. If you're joining us today for the first time, boy, honey, we picked a great time to come to this church on this sermon series, right? Don't, don't be discouraged. I'm not against having a negative outlook on life. I'm not against having a positive outlook on yourself. I'm not, against any, I'm, not, I'm not for a negative outlook or against a positive outlook on yourself. But here's what I want you to see. Until we understand who we are apart from Jesus Christ, we will never see our need for Jesus Christ. In fact, someone said it this way, you will never savor the sweet until you have tasted the sour. You will never savor the sweet, the sweetness of Christ, until you've tasted the sourness of our sin. And so Paul begins this way in 1 Timothy. If you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 12. We like to say word at Long Hollow. If you're there, you can, you can say word. The word of the Lord. Paul says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man, but I receive mercy. Mercy and grace really are through this whole passage. But I receive mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I want to give you two insights from Paul's own testimony. Paul's life, in a sense, is going to be the, the paradigm for us to learn about salvation. Number one is this. God gives grace to those who are undeserving. Wouldn't you agree with that? Anybody in here say, I was deserving of salvation? You probably don't deserve, right? <laughs> no, you, you think you can earn salvation, right? Nobody in here real, thinks that we earned anything from Christ. And that's what Paul says. Paul said, before Christ, I was far from God. In fact, he's very self-condemning in a sense. He says, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was an arrogant man. Now, everyone in here, listen to me. If you're a believer, everyone in here can connect with Paul and say, that's who I was formerly before you surrendered to Christ. Everybody in here who is living in sin and separated from Christ, or in a sense lost as far as finding Christ, you are presently shackled by sin, presently. And the key word here is formally. Now, some of you in here would say, well, but I don't study, I don't struggle with blasphemy. I don't struggle with arrogance. I, I don't struggle with being a persecutor. Yes, you may not struggle with those things, but everybody in here has a sin list, right? You may be a liar. You may have anger in your heart. You may be an antagonist of someone. You, you may be a drunkard. You may be someone who is always against people. You may be a gossip. And the key here is we're all sinners in here, right? We get that. But the question is, are you formally? That's what Paul says. I was formally, there's a difference between I am a sinner and I was formally a sinner. For Paul, in a moment, he doesn't say we're free from sin because he's gonna say he was, he's the chief of sinners. What Paul is getting at is something interesting. Paul is going to say that when I was far from God in the world, formerly a sinner, the mercy and grace of God met me where I was. 
And then in a moment, he's gonna say, but I am presently the chief of sinners, and aren't you glad that the mercy and grace of God still meets us where we are? Now, Paul is gonna show us that I was formerly, not I am. Let me ask you a question today. What would you say? What would you say, Pastor, I was formerly a blasphemer, a liar, a persecutor? This was the pattern of my life? This was the totality of my existence? Or would you say, I am struggling right now? It's the pattern of my life. I'm shackled to sin. One of the things I want you to realize this, Paul says, I formerly was, is called confession. That's the key there. The way you go from present to past, I was formerly, is through confession. Now, confession is an interesting word. For years, I always thought confession was like confessing with one's mouth, like I confess, and that's part of it. But the word confession in the Bible actually means, don't miss this, to agree with God about something. That's what confession means to agree with God about something. And namely in this passage, it's to agree with God about calling sin, sin. See, because we don't wanna do that. See, we would rather rationalize and minimize and justify our sin, right? It's not really that, it's really not that bad. And I wanna tell you something, true confession leads to life. True confession leads to healing. I, I learned this principle 13 years ago. I befriended a pastor when I moved to Chattanooga. He was about 20 years older than me, and he also had been pastoring the same church in town for 20 years. I mean, he was like a well-known pastor. He had a lot of respect in the community. And so we met for lunch about once every four to six weeks. And he would invest in my life. I really looked up to this pastor. And so you can imagine how overwhelmed I was when I heard the news one Sunday afternoon when someone came up and said, did you hear that pastor so-and-so just confessed on a Sunday morning to his church that he was in an 18-month affair with his assistant, his pastoral ministerial assistant, who happened to be the wife of their worship pastor. I mean, I was, I mean, you can imagine, I mean, I'm only a pastor for five years. I'm only a Christian for, you know, seven years. I, I, I was devastated, devastated. And what devastated me more than anything is the fact that when he admitted and got caught, he got caught, the, the thing that devastated me was he minimized the sin. He just got up and basically said, church, listen, I need to confess. I want you to know I was in an inappropriate relationship with my assistant, but God has forgiven me and I'm moving past this. And in his mind, you ready for this? He thought he was gonna show up next week and continue preaching as if nothing ever happened. But the elders in a wise manner came to him and said, no, no, you, you have disqualified yourself from ministry here and you know, need to go get restoration for your family. And they wisely sent him to uh, a ministry for pastors that who, or who have fallen in the ministry. It's a great ministry, I know about the ministry. And the plan is you go there for 12 to 18 months and you go through a restorative process, first with God, then with your family. And he texted me like six months in, supposed to be there for a year, a year and a half. Texted me six months in, he said, never gonna believe this, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm healed. And I thought, wow, I don't, I don't know if you're, you're, you, you need to leave, right? But he didn't listen. And then less than six months later, less than a year after he had resigned, from his church, he moves back to Chattanooga to plant a church within five miles from the church he had the moral failure. And he's trying to reach out to me when he moved in town and back in town, and I honestly wasn't ready to meet with him. I just didn't think I was emotionally prepared and uh, ready to talk about it, but he was persistent. He wanted to meet with me, had to meet with me, wanted to get back to our monthly meetings again. And so I said, well, I told him, I said, just, just, just schedule the meeting. And he came in the office, and he did not want to talk about the past. That's all he wanted to talk about is what God was doing now and what's happening with the church in the future. And I stopped him early on. I said, brother, listen, I need to ask you a question before we go further. I need to ask you, would you share the steps that led up to the inappropriate relationship that ruined your ministry so that you can give me some warning signs to protect my own ministry and my own family? Would you teach me? 
And I've never forgotten what he said. He, he sat back in the chair and he said, oh, brother Robbie, that didn't ruin my ministry. That was just a hiccup in the ministry. I was 20 years younger than this man, but I just felt compelled by the Lord to share this with him. I said, brother, with all due respect, this is not a hiccup in your ministry. You committed adultery against your wife. You sinned against a holy God, and you ravaged the lives of thousands of people who followed you. Has God forgiven you of this sin? Yes, he has. But until you admit it and confess it, you'll never move on. Friends, here's the principle I want you to get, and I want you to write this down. This is a big principle in the Christian life. Paul shares it in a sense here. Concealing prevents healing. I want you to get this. Concealing prevents healing. When you conceal your sin or rationalize it or minimize it or justify it or gloss over it, you will never experience healing. But when you confess your sin, when you admit your sin, when you name it as sin, yes, this is sin. It's not a hiccup, this is sin. Then basically you receive the mercy and the grace of God. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you've already received that, amen? Amen. But it's not until you confess it. Number two. The second thing we see in this text is God offers salvation through Christ. God offers salvation through Christ, and it's only through Christ. And Paul's going to show us that in verse 15. He says, this is a saying that is trustworthy, Timothy. You need to listen to this. It almost looks like he's contradicting himself from earlier. We'll explain in a moment. It's a saying that's trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I was the worst. Is that what it says? Of whom I used to be the worst. That's what you would expect it to say, but that's not what it says. He says, I am present tense, the worst of sinners. But I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus, might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul says, I am a trophy of the grace of God, of his kindness and mercy. Amen? Verse 17, to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. There are two parts of Paul's line that are worth noting for us, and the first one is this. Paul says, I am the chief or the worst of sinners. You know what that word means in the Greek? I am the foremost. If you have a list of guys in your mind or ladies in your mind who are the most heinous sinners, they've committed the most wicked crimes, Paul says, I'm first above them. And the second thing he he says, which really catches us off guard, he doesn't say, I used to be that or I was that. Paul says, present tense, I am the worst of sinners. Now, here's the question. What are you doing, Paul? Because you just said I was formerly this, and now you're saying I'm presently this. What is it? And the answer is what? Both. And the point Paul's making is, when I was a sinner before Christ, God's mercy and grace were present. Right now, when I'm currently sinning, Christ's mercy and grace is present in my life. But the question we need to ask is, how can Paul, who we think as up there with Jesus, be the chief of all sinners? Isn't that a good question? I mean, how could Paul? Here's an example. If we came in this auditorium and the place was completely black, and uh, we were all standing on the stage, and we couldn't see a thing, I promise. When the lights are off in here, you cannot see a thing. And then all of a sudden, in the corner, back corner over there, someone lights a candle, small little candle, and holds it. Now, from here, we wouldn't be able to see a lot of features of the face or definition, but, but we still see a little bit, enough light to go walk to it. Imagine this is the moment you get saved. There are imperfections in your life. There are issues in your life, but you can't really see them. Remember when you first got saved, you're like, man, I don't sin anymore. I'm free from sin. I used to sin, but I don't sin anymore. Anybody been there? Maybe that was me. Maybe that was pride. Okay, I don't know. And that was a sin, right? But here's the way it works. The closer you walk to the light, the closer you get to the candle, the greater the light, the greater the imperfections that are seen. 
And when you get really close to the candle, if you hold a mirror, you can see literally, man, that hair is out of place. Mine wouldn't, but your, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least I hope not. But no, yeah, I, I have dimples or I have imperfections or I have moles. But you can only see that, don't miss this, the closer you get to the light. Friends, Paul was so close to the light of Christ that the smallest things were noticeable. That's how he could say, I'm the worst of sinners. And at one time, Paul thought that he could be good enough to be saved. Like I could be good enough to be saved. And I wanna show you in our time together that you can't be good enough to be saved or Paul was bad enough to be unsaved. Like Paul did so many bad things that he could be unsaved or prevented from being saved. I wanna show you how both of those are lies from the enemy. Number one is this. Why is works not a part of it? The question I ask someone who thinks they can be good enough to be saved. Like if I do enough good deeds to outweigh the bad, I can be saved. The question I pose is this. How bad can you be and still be good with God? That's the question you ask them. It's a good question to ask. How bad can you be and still be good with God? I mean, let's be honest. What is good enough? Like how do I know I'm good enough to go to heaven? How do I know I'm bad enough to not go to heaven? I mean, is there like a scale? Is it like 52% good works, 48% bad works? Is that what it is? I don't know. Is it like a failing grade of 67 and you're out? Is that what kids get today to get at? What is an F today? Anybody know? Regardless, this, the grading scale is not what we used to have because that's how my kids, they're, they're easy on these grades. When we used to go to school, you know you're getting old when you start saying, when we used to go to school, you know, Rick says, yeah, you used to climb uphill in the snow. I was like, not me, not New Orleans, but, you know. <laughs> but the reality is, you know, it, it, it's, but is it a grading scale? Is it like a certain line that I got to get above or I don't go to heaven? You got to understand, this form of comparative reasoning does not line up with Scripture. Like if I could be just good enough to get to purgatory and then over time I can work my way out into heaven, you can't find that in the Bible. In fact, think of it this way. How many lies does a person have to tell to be a liar? Is it a is it hundred lies? Like, man, that guy's a liar. Is it 10 lies? You know, she's, she's a liar. Or is it one lie? Could you tell one lie and be, I mean, what do you call a man who lies a hundred times? What do you call him? A liar. What do you call a man who lies one time? A liar, still a liar. What about a man who looks at pornography or a woman who's married who has sexual fantasies of another man, which by the way is pornography, if it's lust in your heart. How many times do you have to do that for it to be a sin? Is it once a week? Like, is it just once, eh, maybe, was it once a day? Is it 10 times a day? You see, you see how comparative reasoning doesn't work because if you sin one time, watch this, the Bible says it separates you from Christ regardless of the frequency or the duration. One sin, regardless of frequency or duration, separates you from Christ, which shows us that our good works are not gonna get us in good standing with God. Now, the que same question is this. Are good works even enough? Are good works enough? Because, man, I'm hoping I could just work my way to be good enough for God. Well, Paul really disproves that in Romans 3. Romans 3.10, Paul says, there is no one what? That's a key word there. There's no one righteous. Righteous, write this down, is the economy of heaven. Righteousness is the commerce of heaven. Write it that way. Righteousness is the commerce of heaven. There is no one righteous, not even one. You want to know what the word no one means in Greek? It means nobody. <laughs> so, so, did you know you don't need a seminary degree to read the Bible? How many people knew that? Like you just read it at face value. It's pretty simple, right? No one is righteous, not even one. No one understands. There is no one who seeks after God before God seeks them. All have turned away before God calls them. All are alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even what? Not even one. You know what that one means? It means not one, not anybody, right? It's pretty simple. Uh, we love to play in the home games with the boys. And the game that's really um, one they love to play is Monopoly. Uh, anybody like to play Monopoly? 
But as in any game at the Gallaty home, it's not entertainment, it's a full contact sport. Because if you steal someone's property, boy, whoo, you get it popped in the head by one of the boys. And so it's always about winning. You know, and my boys, they're not really concerned about the properties as much as they are the money. For some reason, they have this fascination with the money. Like, who has the bigger stack? I'm like, son, I own Park Place and Boardwalk. I don't care, Dad. I got 100 Monopoly dollars. I'm like, okay. Uh, imagine after the game, you know, Rigger, Ryder, they, they're all excited. They decide to take their money from Monopoly and go to Target. I would say Toys R Us. When I was thinking about this this week, I'm like, man, I got really bummed out. How many people back in the day, it would be Toys R Us? Anybody that age? Where a kid can be a kid, right? I mean, really. Uh, now you got to be a kid at Target. I don't know how, but you got, right? So you're at Target, and Rig and Ryder pick out all the toys, and they go to the conveyor belt, and man, they're excited. The lady's checking them out, or the guy's, he's ringing them up, and all of a sudden they get there, and the lady says, that'll be $150. And Rig says, perfect. He pulls out his Monopoly money, and he starts to count, you know, fives. And she said, hold, hold on, son. What is that? And he said, well, this is my money. And she's going to say to him, no, you don't understand. We don't accept that kind of currency. Like, we only accept U.S. mint currency from the government. And Rig would say to her, no, you don't understand. I own Baltic Avenue. <laughs> I mean, that'd probably be Rig, or it might be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Or, or, or the Tennessee Railroad. I mean, you don't understand. And she would say, no, you don't understand. That's not how we use it here. The economy of America is built on the back of the U.S. Mint. And the currency we accept is dollar bills. Don't miss this. Your self-righteousness, your good deeds, trying to give to God in order to earn something from God is like playing monopoly money in the economy of America. Don't miss this. It doesn't amount to anything. Your, your best deeds don't amount to anything in the currency of America. And I told you earlier, what is the currency of the kingdom? It is righteousness. This is why Isaiah said, and this is sobering, Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteous deeds are like what? Polluted garments. The best we have in ourself to give to God are filthy rags. Some of you, don't miss this, are trying to purchase favor from God with currency that has no value in God's economy. And here's the reality, sadly, some of you are gonna stand before the Lord that day on judgment day and you're gonna bring your best works to God and you're gonna realize when it's time to cash in the chips, you are spiritually bankrupt. You built your house on the sand and not on the solid rock of Christ. Now, if you're at the place which should be, if you're at the place now where you're saying, man, I feel like I'm spiritually bankrupt. I feel like I can't be good enough to earn the favor of God. That's a good place to be. Why? Because at that place, you realize that the only person who can save you is one who is perfect and righteous, which was Jesus. But you're probably saying, but Robbie, God can't save me. Like Paul, he realized he couldn't be good enough to earn the favor of God. But, but you, you may be saying, but I am bad enough to prevent me from coming to God. That's some of you in here. You don't understand the kind of sin I committed in the past. God couldn't, watch this, God couldn't forgive a person like me. In this passage, Paul destroys that whole line of thinking, right? I knew another man named Paul. He, he was not this Paul, it was another Paul. He was, he was at my first church in Morgan City when Candy and I had gotten there. And uh, he was an interesting man. We called him Brother Paul. He was a retired uh, military Navy SEAL. He was older in years, and uh, before I went to his house for the very first time, when I visited him, some people told me he's, he's old, he's ornery, and uh, he doesn't like pastors. <laughs> That's what they told me. But, but I went anyway, and I learned in the process he didn't like the last pastor, and frankly, his wife said he didn't like any pastor, really, for that matter. But I decided to go. And for some reason, he, he liked me. He got along with me. And I don't know if it was because I used to do MMA fighting. I don't know if he liked hearing stories of 
pre-Christ experiences of bouncing and bartending and throwing people out. I don't know what it was, but I would tell him some of these stories. And at the end, when I get to the end of the story, I would say, Brother Paul, you tell me a story about the Navy SEALs, right? And he never, watch this, he never would share a story with me from his past. He, he, he would say to me, he said, he said, you don't understand, Brother Robbie. He said, I was trained to seek and destroy. And sadly, I had done that more times than I wanted to. And so if it's okay with you, I don't wanna talk about it. And so we never talked about it. Now we would go out to dinner with him and his wife. We became friends with him and uh, we would go over to the house to eat. And every now and then Paul would leave and then I'd say, tell me a story real quick. She'd tell me a story, you know, she'd tell me something. And one day she told us this story. Candy will remember this. It is a crazy story. And her and the family said it was true. So as crazy as it is, uh, they said he just came back from uh, retiring from as a SEAL. And uh, they were riding through town, him and his wife at the time, uh, they just got married. And uh, they were coming home on a date night one night about nine or 10 and four 20 year old boys decided to tailgate his car. Talk about a bad car to tailgate, right? I mean, he's gonna tailgate his car. He was going slow, you know, kind of driving home. And they start tailgating, they start hitting the horn and yelling at him. And uh, she said, Paul pulls up at the red light. He puts it in park real calmly. He leans over and he says, honey, lock the door and lay down. He get, gets out the car, closes the door. The four guys jump out of the car, she said. He took every one of them out. Got back in the car. Closed the door, she said, we never spoke of it the entire way home. He drove as if nothing had happened, okay? That's the kind of guy we're talking about here, okay? Paul had surrendered his life to Jesus before I came to Emmanuel, but he still struggled with his previous sin. And I believe in a room this size or online, there's some of you who are right there right now. He knew the facts of the Bible that God washes our sin from the east to the west, but he couldn't get that emotionally and spiritually and mentally, he couldn't, he couldn't get it to his heart. So he felt guilt and shame, even to the end of his life. I got a call from his wife one afternoon and she said, Pastor Robbie, uh, would you come to the hospital? Paul's battle with cancer is coming to an end. Uh, she said, he only is asking for you, would you come? And so we went to the hospital and I remember walking in and I, I walked in and saw a man who, who at one time was the epitome of strength and power, who now had been reduced to pain and suffering confined to a hospital bed. He had tubes in his nose and tubes coming out of his mouth. And I walked over and I pulled a chair up and I sat next to the bed and, and I grabbed his hand. And I said, hey, Brother Paul, it's, it's me. You wanna know the one question he asked me? It's the one question he asked me. He said, Brother Robbie, he whispered, Brother Robbie, are you sure God has forgiven me? And I said, Brother Paul, we've been over this so many times. I, I told you, listen, the Bible says that God has forgiven, listen to me. The Bible says God has forgiven you. The Holy Spirit bears witness that God has forgiven you and your life proves that God has forgiven you. I said, listen, if God for can forgive someone like me, I promise you he can forgive someone like you. And then I asked him this question and I whispered in his ear. I said, Brother Paul, do you believe, do you believe that God has forgiven you? He didn't say a word, it was hard to talk. He had a nose in his, his, or had a tube in his nose and mouth, and he simply looked at me and nodded his head, yes. The next day he met Jesus and I did his funeral and I shared that story. I can't help to think that in a group this size, there are some of you who you hear me say that God has forgiven you, but you have not forgiven yourself. And it's time to forgive yourself. Friends, listen to me. When you confess your sin to God and, and the things you've done before God, you will receive grace and mercy from God. Paul destroys the idea to say that uh, God can't forgive a person like me. If anybody could feel guilt or shame or, or pain in his life, it would have been Paul because he would have said, I did all these things against Christians. But Paul said, I'm gonna focus instead on mercy and on grace. 
So here's what I wanna do. I wanna give you an opportunity today because I feel like some of you are saying, man, I, I think I maybe try to earn my salvation that I don't have assurance that my spiritual bank account is, is empty right now. Or, or maybe some of you in here are saying, hey, I feel like God has forgiven me, but I haven't forgiven myself and it has hindered and crippled me for so long. And, and today, brother, listen to me, you're gonna experience freedom today, but you have to confess and you have to respond. You're gonna have to respond to the call of God. The Bible says, if you hear the voice of God, don't harden your hearts. And so I wanna pray over those who are saying, that's me, you're, you're talking to me today. Would you just bow your head for a moment? And if you're in here today and you're saying, hey, I wanna I want receive that. I, I need the mercy and the grace of God for salvation, for healing, for restoration. I need the guilt and the shame removed. I know in my head, God has forgiven me, but I haven't experienced that in my life. And I promise you, when you cry out to God and you receive that, I promise you, like Brother Paul, right before he met Jesus, when I said, God's forgiven you, do you forgive yourself? He said, yes. Would you just stand for a moment, I'm gonna ask you to do something you're not normally doing in church, but I'm gonna ask you right now, if you're saying, I want that, whatever you are talking about, I need that mercy and grace in my life. I'm just gonna ask you to stand, and in your standing, I'm going to pray over you. Because I believe if you are desperately in need and you desire a change in your life, you will do anything, anything for it. And so if that's you, Pastor, you're speaking to me. I want the mercy and grace of God on my life, and I'm going to ask you to pray over me. Would you just stand? There's something about publicly acknowledging that before God. Thank you, brother. Others are standing. Would you just stand? Just a moment. I'm not going to, we don't have much time. Just a moment. Pastor, that's me. I want the mercy and grace of God. Thank you, brother. Is there someone else? the balcony, maybe at home. Maybe if you're at home, you just want to kneel down next to your couch. If you're saying in here, I, I've tried to earn my way to God. I've tried to be good enough, and it only has left me frustrated, and I'm ready to just receive grace. Thank you, brother, and mercy. Thank you, sister. Anyone else? People already standing all over. No one looking, but those standing. Thank you up top. Anyone else? Just a moment longer. Just stand right where you are. Pastor Abby, pray for me. I need prayer. I need prayer. Thank you. If you're standing, look at me for a moment. I'm going to pray over you, but praise God. No one but those standing. Praise God for you making a public profession. And I really believe that uh, God's going to honor this. And uh, I, I'm not asking you to do anything I didn't do when I was in a position like you. Uh, I'm going to ask you in just a moment. We're going to pray. I'm going to pray over you. But just a moment, uh, we're going to stand and sing. And just as the Lord leads you, I'd love to have one of our pastors, one of our leaders, just pray over you, get some information to show you how to walk in this thing called the Christian life, and just to have people come alongside of you. So as soon as I pray, we'll stand, and you just kind of make your way to the next step area. Father, I pray right now for those who are standing. I know this is, this is a big deal. It's not easy to do, but God, we believe that when we step out in faith, and trust you, you respond. God, everybody in the Bible who cried out for healing or help, God, God it caused you to, to stop and it caught your attention and uh, God, it made the difference. So I'm praying today for guilt and shame. God, I'm praying for the man today who is struggling with sin of the past, maybe in the military, maybe uh, uh, in a situation he had no control over and he's still bothered by it. Would you set him free today in Jesus' name? Would you set the woman free from a past issue or sin in her life. God, set her free in Jesus' name we pray.